Hey pals, did you know that even podcasts have websites? Come check out our website at GoWithTheHeat.com and see show notes, new RSS feeds, contact, and how you can support us. Now let's quit chumping and get on with the show. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm Joan. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guys, the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 22, titled Viking Bikers from Hell. <laughs> I like the <laughs> emphasis there. <laughs> it originally premiered on April 3rd, 1987. It is written by Walter Kurtz. Now, this is an interesting one. It's titled as Walter Kurtz. That's who wrote this, but it's actually a pseudonym. The man who wrote this name is actually John Milius. And for whatever reason, for this episode of Miami Vice, he didn't feel like putting his real name on it. I think I have an idea why. <laughs> I could come up with a couple of reasons why I would put my name on this one. <laughs> this episode feels like other ones that we've had where it's about weird Miami Vice. Yeah, it's definitely the like the weird section of Miami Vice that you don't know the underbelly, the seediness of. Yeah, and this has the same feel as uh, like nobody lives forever. It's just like. It's slightly off, as if you were to take a record and play it at a slightly different speed. Like the meat fondler. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, okay, that's just it, the name it now. Just, <laughs> <laughs> it stands out to me. It's supposed to be like a biker gang episode, but at the same time, I mean, we're talking about three bikers on, like, Kawasaki ninjas. <laughs> um, yeah, that, like, the scooter I, part. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's like the 80s version of a biker gang that's like not so much a biker gang, I guess. Well, there's only three of them. What kind of gang is that? <laughs> that that's Anyways. what I'm saying. You know, it, it could have been four, but they killed Charlie. <laughs> Poor Charlie. <laughs> I bring it up that's like this on the weird side for Vice and it's slightly off center is what it feels like for a Vice episode because it's directed by James Quinn, who also directed Lend Me an Ear. Which is another one of those episodes where it's slightly off. Like, they're talking about technology and spying and all that stuff. And they have Sonny at the end coming across his TV screens and stuff. Like, it's a little off center. Yeah, true. Spins a little mm -hmm. oblong. But you don't have <laughs> such a such a uh, livid reaction to this episode like you did to that one. <laughs> I don't know. We haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You might want to go back and refresh your guys' memories and listen to Dominic's final thoughts on that one. <laughs> Before we get started, to check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys. The Video Game Awards were this week, or this last week, and the voted best game is something that should remind everyone that how great the 80s were. Remember, in the 80s, what was the big console? Nintendo. Nintendo. And so who won mm -hmm. best mm -hmm. game in for 2017? Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, a Nintendo game. That wow. was the launch title for the Nintendo Switch. Oh. Wow. So no matter how much the world has changed wow. with multiplayer arena, battle arena games, and Twitch, and... And all this stuff that happens with video games, you know what the classic game, what people really love? A single player story driven game on a Nintendo console. Now, you so, know what that tells me? That there are a lot of three and 40 year olds who bought Nintendo Switches. <laughs> That's exactly um, what it is. <laughs> They're the only ones that yes, can afford it. Because, it's expensive. <laughs> because they spent a year of their life playing Zelda at one point during high school, junior yeah. high. Well, I hope not high school. No, <laughs> junior <laughs> high, maybe. You know. It wasn't a shock to people that this game was con considered to be the best game of the year. I just love that Nintendo's back, Zelda's back, Mario's back. Now, all the things that I remember from what I loved about video games in the 80s are back, like brawlers and side scrollers. I know we're getting kind of deep into the weeds for video games here. Mm -hmm. Anecdotally match it up because I was at Target and GameStop over the weekend. And in both stores, there's a line of people waiting to get Nintendo consoles. Let's go talk about this episode and another reason why everyone in Miami should know that Sonny Burnett is a police officer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go talk about this episode. So when we open up this episode, we are at a sunset with a Viking statue in the background. I don't know. This is one of those ones like, okay, Viking. me, weird Miami's coming. <laughs> a beach. A more like a fire. Roman soldier <laughs> to me. Yeah, it looks like some kind of soldier. Like Julius right, yeah. Caesar. <laughs> so when we fade out from the statue, we go to like a park. 
Well, there's some trash cans and cars on fire and a bus pulls up and lets off a man. I guess it's just a regular stop for the bus. Like they just The bus you know. doesn't think it's weird to drop a man <laughs> off at a flaming car. <laughs> Especially if you're in a prison bus. Like, I don't really uh, understand what's going on. I, I have think a feeling this guy's going to reoffend. I do think it's the, it's the beach, which is not realistic because you can not drive in that bus on no beach. <laughs> it's getting stuck. Can, can you just buy like old prison vans, like uh, I buses? Guess. I just mean, drive do they around. just sell those at auction? Yeah. <laughs> so a man gets out, Reb. We find out his name. And Reb's also his name in real life. So apparently he has some issues. Remember. He probably was like, Reb, there won't be in your movie unless you put my first name in there. You know, he looks like the type of guy that talks to the first person about himself. <laughs> I think he kept forgetting his character's name. And they're like, screw it. We'll just call you. We'll just call him Reb. <laughs> So then three motorcycles pull up and they kind of do a lap around them and then all park. And this is when it gets even more <laughs> awkward because they're like, hey, Reb, you've been eating well. He's like, yeah, you know, yeah, it's all right. They seem like generally nice guys. Like, yeah, cool. <laughs> We're like, really worried about you. You okay? <laughs> <laughs> so and just hanging rip- out. <laughs> and then Reb rips his shirt off and they toss him a vest. Uh, okay. Yeah, because right. when you're a biker, you need a vest. You can't wear a regular <laughs> shirt. And he's clearly out because they're going to a funeral the next day. Some guy named The Wire, as we find out later, his last name's Constantine. He's the key part of this episode. Reb also sees Charlie. Doesn't like him immediately. Yeah, immediately he picks up on him. He's like, who the hell are you? And I don't get it. Charlie's uh, such a cool guy. If you really got to know Charlie... He would yeah, like him. No. Yeah, I know. You would have liked him. <laughs> and the other two guys, I mean, just right out of the gate, we have pretty much our biggest three guest stars in this episode. I, I think we're going to start with the pack leader, Lasko, who's played by John Tuzak. He was a defensive end. Uh, he was drafted in 1973 by Houston Oilers, number one overall. Well, what's weird is that he tried to move to the World Football League in 1974, but contractual issues doing so. He would end up spending most of his career with the Open slash Los Angeles Raiders and actually win two Super Bowls with them. Aside from that, when he got into acting, his first role was 79's North Dallas 40. But obviously, he is best known for his 1985 portrayal of Sloth in The Goonies. Oh, no way. It's the same guy? I just spit my water out. <laughs> I was like drinking my water. It's like, Sloth. What? <laughs> <laughs> yes, like like the most iconic, and I mean, it was in '85 when he did Goonies, so that this is like one of the next things he would have done. I'm, the rest of the episode, I'm just gonna be picturing him. <laughs> I know, <laughs> <laughs> Ruth, baby. <laughs> Something uh, kind of cool, too. In 78, he had placed ninth in the world's strongest man competition. But unfortunately, he is no longer with us. In 1989, he died of an accidental overdose at 38 years old. So, But he was actually known when he played football as like one of the uh, hardest partying football players. Like He had a reputation for it. Now let's get to Reb. Robert Reb Brown played plays Reb. Because, I mean, that's easy. <laughs> so he was in a bunch of really, really bad movies. Like, really bad. Like, I didn't recognize them, and then I IMBD'd them. Uh, and they were just terrible. Terrible. So I'm going to name a couple things that I thought were kind of cool. Uh, he played Captain America in the TV Captain America movie. And in the TV movie sequel, Captain America 2, Death Too Soon. <laughs> <laughs> He, he also made a guest appearance in a, uh, I'm assuming, a TV show called Bosom Buddies. So, oh, oh yeah. yeah, that's with Tom Hanks. Yeah. That, that's the first thing Tom Hanks was on with Bosom Buddies. Oh, OK. We dress like women. Okay. It's like two so. roommates dressing like women to get mm-hmm. to live in an apartment. Yep. I, I have no idea. <laughs> I knew <Okay>. you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to Toad, our final biker, played by Sonny Landham. His very, very next role. After playing Toad, he would play Tracker Billy Soul in Predator. Yes, like one of the most badass characters in the history of action film. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So then after Predator, he would go on to go to, he would do Action Jackson. That's the very next movie after that. His part of it is he actually started his uh, movie career in the movie The Warriors. He was the cop whose legs get broken with a baseball bat. I don't know if you remember that scene. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> but aside from that, he actually started his career in porn. So <laughs> if you don't know him from any of those movies, you might know him from The Honey Cup or he was fabulous at Big Abner. <laughs> you um, might. You may not Great. remember him, but you may remember a little Sonny. <laughs> <laughs> or little Abner. <laughs> so, and <laughs> after a career in porn and acting, he in uh, 03, he would run for governor of Kentucky. Because that makes sense. It makes sense <laughs> he's from Kentucky. <laughs> that does. Oh, well, you, you know what's funny? He would have been the third governor out of the Predator movie with Schwarzenegger and Ventura. Yeah, because yeah, uh, they, except they, he lost. Yeah, yeah he <laughs> lost. Shane so, Black, you're our only hope. Uh, and he actually, he's a terrible politician. He actually has been tried to run for Senate after losing as at governor, and he's lost a bunch of times running on, <laughs> on a libertarian ticket. You know, running under things like anti-Muslim and stuff like that. Ouch. So, uh -huh. well, Kentucky, no, I'm sure. <laughs> which, which is weird. I want to say he's Native American. So, Well, right away, these three, except for Charlie. Not Charlie. <laughs> they hit it off. They're going to see the Wire's funeral, and Reb has sworn revenge against the people who are responsible for killing the Wire. They're going to now hunt down everyone who he had seen right before he died, which we find out later is everyone he did deals with in the last two weeks. About eight people is so, who Reb and the gang are going to run down. Now, before we leave, there is a very strange scene in which they give him a gun, and he shoots a car that was already on fire, and everyone's <laughs> impressed by this. <laughs> yeah, they're like, wow, he shot that car that was already on fire. Well, it was already on fire. <laughs> and Lasco looks shocked like the entire scene. He's just big eyed, shocked the entire time. And then when Rev. Well, because like, he shot Charlie. <laughs> well, he told him that you have to ride on the back of his scooter. He's like, where's like, my scooter? Yeah. And they're like, well, you have to ride on the back of Charlie's. And he shot him in the head. And he's like, I don't ride on the back of it. Nobody. It's a brutal scooter gang. <laughs> Scooty Puff Jr. <laughs> and then we go to the opening credits. So when we come back from the opening credits. We're at the church at the service. It's for The Wire. Gina and Trudy and Switek are all stationed around. Trudy's not as good at hiding in the bushes. <laughs> well, she's not hiding pictures. at all. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> They're taking pictures of everyone who's in attendance. They're doing surveillance, so we can just assume they don't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> the duo are actually at the funeral. And so when they come walking out, we zoom in on them as they're walking out to Sonny's car. And Tubbs is saying... It's weird attending the funeral that they caused. Like, yeah, pretty much. Guys, guys, you've been to plenty of these. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Isn't that every funeral you go to because of you? No, that was just Zito. <laughs> <laughs> just calls it like I see it. And we get out of the story that Sonny's the one that actually shot the wire. Yeah, that's a really weird thing. Like, yeah, it doesn't come up that much, though, does it? Really? No, it doesn't. <laughs> and it should have been really obvious. Like, they're hunting all these people. I wonder who they could be going after. Like, maybe we should protect the person that shot and killed this man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny's just going on about how it's the wrong place at the wrong time. Like, it was just a deal that went bad. He's he was undercover, obviously, as Burnett. But he seems to be OK with it. Like, yeah, I mean, it happens. I, well, he was saying he was going to die. If he I didn't sort of think that they might want to keep that information to themselves. Yeah, not the at the actual at funeral. <laughs> There's people walking all around them and they're just talking about it. <laughs> Our biker gang is also watching, taking pictures, too, because they're going to kill everyone involved. But did they not go to the funeral? I didn't understand that part. I thought they were like best friends. Why didn't he go to the funeral? No, they didn't go. They like sat outside because the violators go by their own. Are you sure? Also. Because they're wearing matching leather um, yeah. uh, trench coats like they're wearing like their nice coats. Oh, so, almost. Like they pro I mean, I don't know. I can't tell. It looks to me like. They didn't attend the funeral. They're out there just staking out. Yeah, it does because they don't they don't talk to anybody or anything. They well, see. Would you talk to them? <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't. No. <laughs> they seem to be fixated on one woman who leaves in a limo. Then a long line of expensive cars leaves the church. We go over to the precinct, and the wire 
his name is Constantine, so I'm just going to call him Constantine from now on. His last name is Constantine, so I'm just going to call him Constantine for the rest of the episode. His name's Ed. Ed. <laughs> All right, fine, Ed. We'll yeah, call him true. Ed. Yeah. <laughs> the vice team is worried about the gap that's going to leave in the streets now that he's not available as a dealer, so there might be some warring happening in the streets. But then also, they're reviewing all the people who are in attendance, and they recognize one person, Rudy, that Crockett recognize but no one knows who the lady is in the limo which is who the vi- the violators were paying attention to as well sunny picks up her picture and asks where she rented the limo and then he walks off because you know sunny he knows everybody also it's a woman he's like i gotta find out where this lady is <laughs> i'm sorry i was distracted during this scene because things are about to be very hard and move very fast down on the street <laughs> so it's picturing how hard and fast it was gonna be <laughs> reb is meanwhile at in some garage watching a video will for ed where ed is saying he gives everything that he owns to victoria his sister and then also yeah, says Vicky, hey reb, you get all crap <laughs> And then also says, hey, Reb, I really, really love you. You're like my best friend. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very weird video, Will. I think that was very strange. <laughs> the way Did he know it was coming? I like, don't know. The whole like... thing was weird. It was like more like he was trying to tell me he was in love with him. Not and had nothing to do with like his inheritance. It's like, by the way, <laughs> we should have boned out one time. Like a pretty laid back guy too, kind of Tommy Chong ish. Why is he even hanging out with Rebs at the little company? The duo show up and they're talking to the owner TJ, and they just strong arm him. He's like, I think you need a court order. He's like, Ha, yeah. We do, but we're not going to get one. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and give us evidence that's going to be inadmissible in, in court. Hey, this show is only an hour long, okay? <laughs> it's because they don't plan on going to court. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's only an hour long. We don't got time for a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> it is a two-part. <laughs> <laughs> TJ says that it's Ed's sister. It's the one that rented the limo. So now we know who his sister is, and we know that she got all the inheritance. And so, and so now the violators are on their way over to Victoria. She's an artist. Got a studio, painting on the walls. Reb comes in to talk to her, and she is not happy to see him. Dude, you probably shouldn't be so bitchy when you're talking to mean-ass bikers. <laughs> <laughs> She's an artist. She don't have time for that. <laughs> she needs to invest in front. That's what she needs to do. <laughs> she says she doesn't want anything to do with her brother, whatever her brother was mixed up in, any money from it, because they know any of the people. She wants nothing to do with anything from her brother's business. Or the people associated. What if he has like a couch or a coffee table? I mean, come on. <laughs> you need him. Spruce the place up a little bit. Just because you're an artist doesn't mean, mean. Exactly. Credit to Reb, though. He's hardcore Viking biker going to murder everyone that hurt his friend. But also soft to the touch and really says he things from his heart and wants to take care of Victoria for his best friend. Because he has an oath. He took an oath of loyalty to his best What kind of weirdo? Do you and John have an oath that I don't know about? Is something going to happen to you someday and then John's going to be like, I took an oath. <laughs> That's for you to find out in my okay. video, Will. <laughs> when you leave everything to John. <laughs> John, in my oath, do you remember the oath you took? (laughs) Reb begs to help Victoria, but she says, get out. And so they just leave. She says, I just want his money. I didn't really want anything to do with my brother. He just paid for it. She goes, he paid for everything. He took good, really care of me, but I don't want to know about anything. (laughs) Um, Is it it weird that she ran to the limo? Did did that strike anyone else's eye? That was weird. I thought that was weird because she's not like in the, like the hearse where they're driving. I don't know. It's really weird. (laughs) Strange. The violent head right over to go talk to someone named Salazar. Now, this is their first hit. They got eight people that they're working down. They show up. They knock on the door as and disguise themselves as flower delivery. That's not the part that catches my eye. The part that catches my eye is the crossbow they brought to do the hit. <laughs> yeah, right. Because that's that's your usual weapon. He had a crossbow bag that matched his jacket <laughs> when he pulled it out. <laughs> it was like a pleather bag. Because <laughs> you know that's not real leather. You know, <laughs> I can just picture the conversation. They're in the van driving over to do this hit. And they're like, Dan Toad, why did you bring the crossbow? And he's like, man, I bought the crossbow i've got to use it you know i bought the matching bag like, like come on this is a perfect situation i finally get to use the crossbow like fine we'll let you use the crossbow even though it's not practical at all 
after they shoot and kill the bodyguard, they go to the back and they talk to Salazar, and they want from Salazar, they want to know where the coins are. This is where Ed's money is in, in doubloons or some <laughs> yeah, shit. Yeah, I don't know. He calls it some <laughs> weird name. <laughs> Gives it up pretty quickly, and then they go get the coins, and they come back, and Salazar thinks, like, all right, cool, like, thanks, guys, see you later. <laughs> yeah, he's all like, right. all right, you got what you want, and you leave now. <laughs> yeah, gold, gold cougar, cougar morans, I think. Yeah, there you go. It's, it's like something weird. Yeah, cougarins or something. Pirate money. Yeah. <laughs> Viking. <laughs> <laughs> Damn pirates. Just keep coming. It's popping up everywhere. <laughs> in this scene we really get to see what they're all uh all the bikers are good at you know reb's the one that talks good lasco's good at doing dunks you know <laughs> toad toad can fight and stuff <laughs> <laughs> the scene ends with reb drowning salazar in his hot tub we fade out and we fade back in and the police are there with the duo and castillo Castillo says... What happened to the girls there in the hot tub with him? I don't know. They just stayed there and watched. They don't hurt any of the women because they also they just later on kill somebody. They were just them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they say like they don't... They, they later on they kill someone and they leave the lady behind too. <laughs> Castillo says this... We're starting to see the fallout from Ed's death and then also please go talk to Victoria. Do something about her. <laughs> we have a real fast scene where the violators <laughs> stop off to kill another person. You don't see anything. It's just really fast. They're like, okay, now another person is dead. And then we go to Reb's and we have like this quick scene where they happen back to back where then Reb at his place is just saying his duty is almost fu fulfilled. Like his oath is almost given now. And then we jump over to Victoria's. The duo are there and they're talking to her, but she won't give up any information. Says her brother was always good to her, doesn't give any names, and Crockett just leaves his car. So there are these three really fast scenes and not a whole lot of information here. But then we go to the most important scene <laughs> in the entire the episode. Entire... Maybe the whole season. Oh, come on. The stripping was not more important than this. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing like a lounge act at a bus stop. Like For old I, don't, I don't even know where Izzy is. <laughs> Izzy's in a nice suit with the ruffles, and he is doing a full lounge singing. He's like singing and then talking to people where in the are you audience. From? He's like asking the lady. She's doing like an old lady doing a crossword <laughs> puzzle in the audience. He, I think he's answering. She's, she's not answering. answering for her, yeah, yeah, it's like she's not even answering. <laughs> It's fantastic. He's just, and he's singing his heart out. He's really working hard. Who knows how the equipment got there, where it came from, you how he knows how to work it. Don't ask questions about Izzy. <laughs> time and time again, he tells you he can't keep a job. <laughs> and he's very talented in many things. <laughs> in the middle of his song, the violators show up and Izzy immediately recognizes them. He flips out, jumps back on the stage, grabs his mic stand to try and defend himself. And he's me like, what's up, Reb? Hey. Hey, we're buddies, right? <laughs> want Don't my hurt car? Me now. <laughs> you can have my car. It's parked yeah, right there. Yeah, you want my car? <laughs> Reb just starts showing him photos and says, I want you to give me names. And Izzy reluctantly agrees. And when it gets to the duo, he's like, I don't know who those guys are. I, I don't know. I don't know. But. Bunch of losers. They're a bunch of real <laughs> nobodies. Yeah, he's out there low Especially level. Especially that Crockett, I mean. Burnett. <laughs> yeah, he eventually dumps says Cooper and Burnett. It's like, but they're pawn scum. We all lightweights. You don't want to mess around with them. You don't, don't even bother. Kind of I guys think it's to funny. steal Kim Babies. <laughs> I think it's funny that he didn't care about the other people he was giving away, but he did care about Crockett and Tubbs. Mm -hmm. Was it because they're policemen or just because like he didn't give a crap about those other people? <laughs> <laughs> and then before Reb leaves, he calls Izzy a worm. And I'm like, God damn it, you mother... <laughs> Don't you be telling Izzy that. <laughs> Those are fine words, Reb. We're going to get you, God damn it. <laughs> he's in his best suit. He can't be a worm. Don't you see he's working right now? He can't defend himself. <laughs> so now the duo go over to an apartment, and the local PD are there. This is at night. The hotel heard screams they, from Pena's apartment, and they called in the police. The police showed up, and apparently all they did was just knock on the door and then go, screw this. This is a Cooper and Burnett problem. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to call them. <laughs> no homicide, though. <laughs> apparently, homicide so, doesn't do I, anything in Miami. I, I do like and they come up, and they're like, it's room 1201. And Tubbs is like, we'll take the 11th floor. <laughs> <laughs> the vice team go up to the apartment. They walk in slowly look around the place they eventually find a body wrapped in a sheet tied to a pillar shot and killed that's a lot of work why did they do all that yeah why'd they shoot him after they wrapped him up they wrapped him up know. with a night bow <laughs> so the next day at the precinct the team are reviewing 
half of everyone that they took pictures of at that funeral are now dead. They're still not sure of what the of what the connection is. Trudy eventually figures out that Ed used quote the violators or biker gang as protection. Now at this point, I'm still not sure why Vice is investigating all of these other people, and I don't think we ever find that out through the entire episode. Yeah, what did what did Ed actually do? Did he sell drugs? Is that why I, they were dealing with him, or what? <laughs> I think so. They mentioned once that the wire gone, that he had like a third of the market, but they don't mention what that market was. So I think they're just following up on the people who attended the funeral to see if there's anyone else that they can make a move on, but they don't really have any evidence. I think they're just like scrounging for loose change, essentially. I get the feeling no one really knows what's going on. <laughs> Except Reb, who I think is convinced he's going to become the Highlander. Yeah, something weird with him. He's not right. I mean, besides the fact he's a murderer, he's not right in the head either. <laughs> There can be only one. Sonny remembers that he knows someone that was a point man for the violators. His name's Jack. And so they're going to go see Jack and he's going to introduce Tubbs to him. So yeah, that's and, and the way Sonny's talking too, like he's really talking him up. Sonny's got a heart on for this guy. Like a real <laughs> man crush. He's a real piece of work. He's got a lot of class. This well, guy. that's interesting because you go to the biker bar and Sonny goes up and immediately starts talking to Jack. And I understand what he's trying to do. He's trying to get them riled up so they could fight. But it gets pretty intimate pretty fast between those two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a little, a little creepy. <laughs> Eventually, Jack does start fighting back. Sonny beats him up pretty good. And he's trying to get information out of him. He wants to know what's happening with the violators. And he, Jack eventually drops it that Reb is out there trying to kill the last eight customers that Ed had. Now, for those of you who know mob and crime tv shows you will recognize jack jack is played by kim coates who played tig on sons of anarchy throughout that uh pretty much the entire stretch he's actually a iconic character on that show that had a very twisted plot line that went along with him so he's a canadian actor and some of the other stuff that he's been in, just big. He was uh, in Bad Boys. He was in Waterworld. He was in Pearl Harbor. Around the time of Vice, he was in The Last Boy Scout with Bruce Willis and uh, one of the Wayans. I think it was Damon. Yeah, you know, Damon. Last Boy Scout. As soon as I saw him, I immediately thought of Tig from Sons of Anarchy. You know, and it's just kind of funny. Uh, the man you know, also playing, doesn't uh, age. He looks exactly the same yeah. as he does right now. The best part of this scene is the return of the mini shotgun, the pocket shotty, <laughs> with Tubbs. And he's uh -huh. wearing sunny sunglasses. Those are the, that's the best part, is those sunglasses. <laughs> so the next day, the Violators are out to go make their next hit. It's a birthday party for the dealer. And the Violators show up to a park across the water and go muscle out a couple who are eating fried chicken in the park in their car. That's a hot date right there. <laughs> and the woman is like, how come you don't defend me against these multiple bi armed bikers? I don't know what she wanted. <laughs> My favorite part is when they put the bucket on her head, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. what she gets for being she's like, look at you. Don't be a wimp. What does she want him to do? Die? He's, the other guy's pulling out a gun while this is happening. What do you want him to do? <laughs> yeah. You deserve that bucket on your head. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I'd be upset too, man. That's quality for our chicken right there. <laughs> <laughs> right in the middle of eating lunch and then they go and they dump your bucket of chicken out. <laughs> Reb gets himself set up. He pulls out a sniper rifle and shoots and kills this other, the next person on their hit list. And no one at the party seems all that surprised. Yeah, he falls into the cake and no one panics. It's like, well, <laughs> he's dead in his cake. <laughs> yeah, that, which is kind of bad that they shot him on his birthday. I mean, blowing out the candles, that's kind of messed up. So, um, also, he, I did want to mention that he is played by Purdy Jackson, who didn't actually have much of an acting career, but he would go on to be a transportation coordinator for the movies Ace Ventura, Bad Boys, Drip Tease, The Transporter 2, and the Miami based TV show Burn Notice. What did he do for transport expertise on Drip Tease? <laughs> I was thinking that. Make sure I don't you make know. it in the middle of the runway. <laughs> Also for the transporter, yeah, like, that's like, like, this sounds funny. <laughs> Transportation. Well, the transporter. Yeah. 
But yeah, I would assume he handled like car chases. So except striptease, I don't know. Maybe he <laughs> he's the one that hired cabs. Maybe I don't I know. Like, There's no car chases in striptease. <laughs> So later, the PD and the vice team are there cleaning up. So I tech confirms Jack's story, says everyone is on business with Ed is now dead. And Sonny's finally like, oh, yeah, uh, I'm probably on that hit list, too. Everyone's like, yeah, we've known all along. We should want to tell you, Sonny. No one knew how to tell you. <laughs> and then for the weirdest scene of this episode, Castillo says, I want you to go talk to the psychologist to get in the head of this killer's mind. You know, like figure him out and he's just like yeah he's nuts <laughs> <laughs> like i don't think you really needed even needed this scene he says he makes manson look like mr rogers and then he he shares with us the brilliant motive well if he kills everyone then, then of course he'll kill ed's killer you know <laughs> and it's like oh yeah we got it the guy's crazy <laughs> but i don't understand they're acting like he was acting when he when he was talking about him he was acting like he knew him he actually met him or something so i was like maybe he's like the the hospital doctor or something and that's what i mean the the prison doctor or something that's why he knows him because he was like yeah he's got an unusual attachment to ed and that's why he feels like he's got this he has to be loyal to him i don't know it was really weird much like this episode yeah <laughs> it's slightly off center yeah <laughs> it's like the next scene also <laughs> yeah there's a fast scene where we see that they're having a party out at reb's but reb isn't down he doesn't like to quote swim in dirty water that is really gross <laughs> wade right it doesn't say wade i don't like to wade in dirty water <laughs> who said you were clean reb you just got out of prison <laughs> After some fighting, Reb tells Toad. But let's just, just get to the thing where Tubbs looks like he gets shot, but really knocks himself out. <laughs> well, when do you mention that? Because at this scene, I have questions about the surveillance capabilities of the vice <laughs> team as well. Once again, <laughs> surveillance yes. is not their strong suit. <laughs> so they're staking out the last three. There's Victoria and Sonny, and then uh, one more person. Tubbs is out there watching the house, and then Switek is watching Victoria, and then Crockett is supposed to be hiding. Now, Tubbs and Crockett are having a conversation <laughs> over the intercom or over the phone. Which is it? Because Tubbs <laughs> is on the car phone, but Sonny's on the radio. You're not supposed to notice that stuff. No one had car phones in the 80s. So people thought like you could talk to walkie talkie with it. <laughs> it's the conversation. If you just part. dial pound 97, you can talk on CB radio. <laughs> Everyone knows that. Switex so East Victoria shows up at her breakwater. I really apartment. hope someone tries that too. <laughs> So that means that's pretty much guaranteed that the violator is going to show up where Tubbs is at. But they come walking out of the front door and then the house explodes. Tubbs did not see them enter that house at all. He is caught 100% off guard when he sees them come out and he sees the house explode. Then he says, hey, freeze, without getting out of his car. He's just sitting in the driver's seat. He shoots Reb twice. Reb's wearing a bulletproof vest that doesn't go down, and then Reb shoots Tubbs, and Tubbs goes down. He's hit. Yes, you are right. Tubbs didn't see three big bikers go into the house. <laughs> so, but what gets me is the end fight scene, or I mean the, the gun battle, because Tubbs shoots him twice in the vest. And like, okay, mind you, Tubbs is stumbled into the car, and then it looks like Reb shoots Tubbs. But we find out in the next scene that Tubbs just has a concussion because apparently <laughs> while being buckled into the car, he tried to dive out of the way and knocked himself out. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because I couldn't put together. I thought maybe he like he was recovering from the bullet wound, but also the war but he also had a concussion was what made him. You can't understand him. <laughs> Oh, that's another thing. Yeah, no, he didn't actually get shot. He's right. He just like dove out of the way so fast he knocked himself out. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> In the car, though. How did he do that? It's not like any He gave car himself a concussion. So, I think he was still buckled in, too. Yeah, exactly. So, I don't know. I don't know. All this because he was talking about Crockett's legs and how they look in pantyhose or something. Rico says at the hospital, he's like, he's a machine. He can't die. I hit him twice. <laughs> two, bull two slugs to the chest. Oh, so I knocked myself out. <laughs> Please, no one asked me for any follow-up <laughs> questions. Crockett's pissed, though. <laughs> he's on a vent. He's taking an oath. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, Castillo wants him off. He's like, you're out of here. You got another person. You got pirates trying to kill you. <laughs> you got multiple drug dealers trying to kill you. And now, now you Vikings? Got, now, now uh -huh. you got 
Reb trying to kill you. You got to get off the streets. And Sunny's like, no, no, one, I'm the only one that has that can do this. I'm the only one that'll be able to handle him. Um, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly Tubbs couldn't well, handle. And him. He, he tries to put Zwitek on it, but Zwitek's busy practicing magic, so he won't be available for for mo- Actually, it's, most it's, of the rest of the episode. He must be really bad at magic. He just keeps reading that one book. <laughs> <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> Actually, Castillo says Switek should do it, and Sonny says Switek can't handle it. So it's, it's, a, it's a little more than just. Ouch, Sonny. <laughs> Words hurt. Just cut him in half. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just because he cuts his finger off every time he does a trick. <laughs> And Victoria's Reb shows up and he drops off those doubloons or whatever. <laughs> They're chocolate coins. <laughs> that, can, can you just take those? Like, how does that work? Do you take them down to your bank and you give them like three cougar morans and that's like equal to the, they hand you $300 back? <laughs> like, is that how that works? Or like, do you have to like look up their value and sell them on like eBay? <laughs> When Victoria sees the coins, she's really excited about it. She doesn't know what they too. are, though. <laughs> and then Reb tries to like, go up and awkwardly touch her face and then changes his mind and then just leaves. Yeah, because apparently he's also supposed to have sex with her. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> note he took, too. I'm supposed to have sex with you. Your brother said I could. So <laughs> let's do this. Yeah, well, he, he couldn't right then because he had to get to biker church. So <laughs> uh, outside, Stan is reading about magic, and he sees Reb get on his motorcycle and ride away, and then he gives chase. So he follows him very awkwardly and not hidden. No, and he follows him all night because it's the <laughs> next morning when they pull up to Reb's <laughs> secret hideout, which is the stupidest secret hideout ever because it has black thunderbolts or something <laughs> painted on the side of it. <laughs> I just like, love how Switek like drives the big green van in, and then like uh, he's like in the middle of the driveway, he just all of a sudden just st- stomps on, uh, uh, stops, and like tries to back into the bushes somewhere. Yeah, he's like, oh crap, this doesn't go anywhere. I can't just drive right by and see it. I'll just park in the bush. <laughs> like, I was waiting for him to like, like like go in and like pull a U turn, like right in the middle of the parking lot. <laughs> Stan calls it in. Trudy says people are on their way. They're going to be there in two minutes, even though it took Stan all night to follow Reb out to this place. But they're going to be there in two minutes. They weren't there in two minutes, for the record. Trudy's and then Gina calls Sonny <laughs> and says, I'm not supposed to tell you this. Dad's going to be real mad. But the man you're looking for is out on this island at the yeah. end of this road. He was <laughs> just an instigator. Why? She can't follow rules. Like, why even call him? I thought he called her. So I was confused on that, but <laughs> inside Toad is asking Reb, what's next? Reb's like, next is we kill Cooper and Burnett, and then we go to Valhalla. And Toad does not get Valhalla at what all. Valhalla is yeah, supposed to like, be. <laughs> so that's cool. We're going out of the country. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't understand that this is a suicide <laughs> mission. Yeah. <laughs> Outside the police are on the house. They call in, tell them to come not out the with police, their hands. The <laughs> Shootout starts, they blow up a police van, blah 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 blah. blah. This is a pretty you know, it's a decent vice shootout. It's not the best. They blow some stuff up. We got that going for us. <laughs> Lasco and Toad both get shot and killed. Reb makes a fantastic getaway on his motorcycle with a gun on one you arm know, and then you, ju- jumps over the yes. motor- over the police car. Do you know who could have helped in this gun battle? Charlie. Charlie could have <laughs> helped in this gun battle. <laughs> Had they not guy. killed him, he could have helped microwave <laughs> that sucker. <laughs> Sunny comes pulling up right when Reb is leaving, so he turns around and gives chase to Reb, which the chase ends at a trailer park. And then Sunny starts well, stopping. Why? Him. Well, why did he stop? Did, did he have to? Is that why he picked that place to stop? I guess so, because it's full of barrels and crates and stuff. Like, he but had a- it's a trailer park by the water, right? Because he ends up in the they end up in the water at the end. What? Well, that's a fancy trailer park. <laughs> yeah, that's waterfront trailer park property. <laughs> That's an extra fifty coins. Stay there. No? <laughs> Reb goes and hides. Sunny stalks around the trailer park for a while. There's a little bit of a shootout, and then Sunny hits Reb, and then goes to find him, and Reb's gone. And then Reb Donkey Kongs him with a barrel from the <laughs> he roof goes, of one of the <laughs> <laughs> and drops a barrel on his head. <laughs> Then the uh-huh. wrestling match starts. By the way, when when Crockett shoots him, it, it was funny. Like even Crockett had this surprised look on his face, like, "Oh my god, I hit him!" 
<laughs> yeah, he was like, there's no way that took him out because he's a machine, remember? Mm-hmm. Tubbs shot him twice mm-hmm. in the vest. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny gets out his ankle gun while Reb is choking him, shoots him three times in the chest, but Reb musters up more strength, charged at him, and they both go over into the water. You get this dramatic pause. What happened? There's still two episodes to go in season three. Sonny's still alive. <laughs> yeah. He better yes. be. Oh, he tried to fight him hand to hand, which, of course, I mean, he's fighting Captain America, so that wasn't going to work. <laughs> yeah, that was So he had to kind of get dirty and shoot him in the belly. He basically ends up with it, with wet loafers at the end of it. So, but Are we not going to talk about how it's such a bad stunt double that he's wearing a terrible <laughs> wig through half of it? <laughs> and then we go to the last scene of the episode. Sonny's watching over Tubbs. Sonny asks, are you awake? And Tubbs is like, yeah, I've been awake. How long have you been faking it, Tubbs? <laughs> I've been faking the whole yeah. thing. I, never, I don't even need this hey, give him my a break. concussion. Give him a break. He almost died when he hit his head on that stick shift. <laughs> and then Sonny goes on this long speech about how there's this weird part. As if all the drug problems. And all the baby, like selling babies yeah, and smuggling children and all this weird stuff they've done that nothing prepares you as a police officer for the real weird underbelly of Miami. Which is true because yeah. this episode reminded uh, me a lot of Tales of the Goat. Yeah, that is true. What was the one with uh, three like punk teenagers that went on that killing spree? Nobody Lives Forever. That That's what that this one reminded me of that. Where it was like the killing spree really didn't make much sense, but they were like supposed to badass, out of control psychopaths. Sonny says so. then Victoria disappeared and we're left with Sonny brooding over that they just need to be better cops. Tubbs laughs. Like, y'all need to be better. How do you think we're going to be better? We're not going to be any better. And then Sonny says, well, fine. You at least need to be a better shot. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> and you need a helmet. <laughs> Crockett, you need to go get me some jello. That's what you need to do right now. <laughs> and then that's the end of the episode. I have many thoughts about this one. I'll say that it's entertaining, but I'm standing by now that we've been through the whole thing again. It's it's just off center. This yeah. this record mm-hmm. was left in the sun. It's a little, <laughs> a little warp. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go talk about this week's music. A lot of these band names are going to sound the same, but I'm not going to give away any secrets. Let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John. When I saw the music selection on this week's episode, I was like, oh, this is Return of the Bands Part 2 Electric Boogaloo. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Basically, you know how in in the music segment, sometimes I'll say like, and we'll see this artist again. Well, this is the episode where we see them all again. (laughs) We will start off with a band I've talked about quite a few times. I think I'll even talk about them again after this. I don't know. We'll see how I feel. Uh, (laughs) Maybe I won't. (laughs) Their song, Type Rope Walk by The Damned. So The Damned is the band with the really cool band member names. You know, they had the bassist whose name was Captain Sensible. (laughs) And the drummer whose name was Rat Scabies. You know, those guys. Uh, And I've probably said it before about them, but Captain Sensible actually formed his own political party in the UK. It's called the Blah Party. (laughs) Quite sensible. Uh, the party was a was a way for British citizens to bitch about things in their daily lives. You know, it was like a party made up for that, like a parody of a party. But they actually did run campaigns and like try and get elected and stuff. They were even sponsored by Seabrook Crisps. So, and if you don't know Seabrook Crisps, they are a delicious snack. Um, <laughs> You have to, they're mostly sold in northern UK, but you can get a mail order too. They, they've got to have a website out there somewhere. So try some Seabrook crisps. <laughs> <laughs> not an ad. So, uh, not, now, not a real ad. They're not giving us any money. We will take your money if you, or free chips if you want to send them to us. We'd prefer the free yes, chips. Yes. <laughs> yes. Please, please send us the chips. <laughs> so, uh, in 2008, though, Blah Party would uh, disconnect with their sponsors, including Seabrook Crisps. <laughs> and they would determine that they were going to become a protest group from then on forward. Makes no sense, but 
<laughs> I mean, why would you give them free crackers? <laughs> and then the drummer of The Damned, Rat Scabies, he's the guy who is also the central character of a book called Rat Scabies and the Holy Grail by Christopher Dawes. He wrote the book in 2005, and the book is basically like a gonzo-esque quest, quest to find Holy Grail. And it's about author meets Rat Scabies as he moves in next to him, and they go on like rock star adventures. So... Um, I don't know, maybe put it on your winter I, reading list. I'm down for some of the, the damned fan fiction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, all right, so let's get on to some more music we've already talked about. We have Heaven by Simply Red. To refresh your memory, Simply Red, a bunch of gingers from the UK. So just, now that you caught up. in our episode last week, right? Yeah, dude, they were like... Just in the music, Mick Hucknell, the lead singer, who also the only uh, member pretty much left in the band, he co-owns Ask Property Development, uh, and they construct city squares and public buildings. So if you're looking to have a city square <laughs> built in your backyard, contact them. <laughs> <laughs> he also likes to spend time in Catania, Sicily, where he makes a wine under the label Il Can Cantante, which I guess translates into the singer. So, by the way, Simply Red has had 27 members, uh, different members since 1985. We're just going to stick with the one we know. <laughs> Another one we might you might remember, George Thurgood and the, the Destroyers. We get their song, Who Do You Love? Which isn't even really their song. It's Originally, it's a Bo Diddley song. It was recorded in 1956. He wrote it when he was in Kansas City uh, after hearing a group of, of kids basically trying to like brag each other. It ended up on George Thurgood's second album, Move It On Over. And in 1985, he actually got to perform it with Bo Diddley at Live Aid. That had to be pretty cool. Last but not least, uh, we have Valhalla by Chris uh, Barr, which actually isn't by Chris Barr. So <laughs> I, I, I went looking for it. Now, by the way, Valhalla was recorded exclusively for Vice. It never appeared on any album or was released as any kind of single. So I'm trying to figure out, who is Chris Barr? What happened to Chris Barr? And then I find IMBD has it credited as being written and performed by Rick Conrad. Rick Conrad. I actually was able to find some stuff on him. He is a composer, producer, location manager, including some other positions. He composed such fabulous TV movies as Amityville, The Evil Escapes, <laughs> in 1989. He also composed The Watchers 2 in 1990. His most recent being the fantastic, highly acclaimed, cloned The Recreator Chronicles in 2012, <laughs> uh, which is about a group of teens <laughs> who stumble upon a secret lab and battle superior clones of themselves. <laughs> He's also done commercial work for, like, Nissan and NASA, which, I mean, I, I didn't know NASA ran commercials. I haven't seen a NASA commercial ever. <laughs> and there you go. There's your music, guys. Even though, basically, every song in this music segment was from a band we had heard you talk about before, there's always something new. <laughs> that it wasn't their song exactly <laughs> i had a feeling like you were you've been holding out on us john there's more information you could be giving us you're hiding <laughs> stuff on purpose from us <laughs> all right let's go mm. give our final thoughts on this episode all right i'm gonna kick off this week i've talked throughout the entire episode about how this is slightly off it's a warped record it's off center it's oblong it's blah 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 i'll say that it's entertaining but it's not entertaining in a good way <laughs> <laughs> this is very similar to like like what we've talked about throughout the entire episode it's like the meat fondler episode it's like lend me an ear it's like tale of the goat it's like nobody lives forever. It's the dark, seedy, really deep underbelly of the city of Miami where all the weirdos are. And they try really hard to make them really weird. But in every case, when this comes up, they just come off really awkward. And so this is an all right episode. It's not as good as the last two that we've had, but it was kind of interesting to see Viking bikers in Miami. <laughs> and it was cool to see someone from Predator in it. <laughs> <laughs> 
(laughs) 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 So, I mean, I've talked about throughout the entire episode, like, it's not one of my favorites. It was okay. It was made me laugh. (laughs) <laughs> for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I didn't get the feeling from the very beginning to even even all the way to the end. There was really much of a of a plot line or a point to to their little crime spree. So I mean I I understand the very basic principle like, oh well if he kills everyone this guy ever associated himself with, he'll kill whoever Killed him, right? But it seemed like a game killing spree, and it, it almost seemed like the Vice Squad was as confused as I was as to, like, what was going on throughout the entire episode. <laughs> what the hell is happening? Why are all these people dying? <laughs> what the hell do they have to do? <laughs> and I made a joke of it, but the only way that this episode really makes any sense is it is if Reb thinks he's the Highlander or something. Thinks that he's like, <laughs> if he ki- kills everybody and he's the last one, he'll absorb all of their power. You know, like you said, it kind of felt like an off episode, you know, and it didn't help that the music was just a regurgitation of everything I've already talked about. I was really hoping that the Valhalla song was going to be like, uh, someone that I could talk a lot about. And then I find out like, no, it's just recorded for Vice, never actually released, uh, no information on it. Some guy who was at the studio recorded it. <laughs> <laughs> kind of middle of the pack episode, ready to get to the big episodes that have got to close out this season. Melissa, you're looking over there very suspicious. About that statement, and then what's your final thoughts on this episode? <laughs> I have no comment about the future. I can't comment on the future episodes. It bugged the crap out of me that they were called the Viking bikers and they rode scooters. <laughs> um, and the fact that they had so many times where they're showing them riding their motorcycle, and then it's clear, <laughs> it's clear that one of them was a bad stunt double that maybe was not even the right color person. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that. No, I mean, it's the same as everyone's already said. It's a, it's not a terrible episode. It's kind of boring. To me, it was kind of boring. And also, I don't really understand Reb at all. <laughs> I don't understand, like, why did he take... Why did he have such a strong oath to this guy? Why... What was the point of killing everybody? Why was he going to go to his death? You would think at some point in time, they would have told us why they were so close. Yeah, why were they so close? Why was he in prison before? Did he take the fall for this guy? I mean, there was so much information that wasn't there. Why did he... Why did Crockett shoot him? <laughs> Ed. Yes. Like, none of that was ever said. Like, it was like, eh, we're just going to gloss over that and go straight to him looking in the shadows, him wanting to touch somebody who doesn't want to be touched. <laughs> Very strange. Tubbs not knowing how to shoot. <laughs> it definitely was uh, an episode that makes the Vice Squad not look that good. <laughs> they might need to go back and brush up on their procedural stuff, like how to surveillance people and also Swite Tech. Swite Tech needs to give up the magic. It's not going to happen. Just give it a rest. It's not going to happen. I know it's all he has and I'm sad for him, but... <laughs> he should invest in captures. I feel like he would be good at tap. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love, 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 love to hear from you. Email us, heat at gmail.com or tweet at us at Go With The Heat. You want to find other ways to contact us? Go to that website, GoWithTheHeat.com. Click on About Us. Click on Contact Us. Click on Subscribe. You can find all the information you would ever need. Our elongated, very detailed show notes are on that website. All of the ways to contact us and including a new tab which are the ways that you can support us. Now, we would love your support. We'd love for you to go to your podcast catcher of choice and give us a review. Two thumbs up, five stars, four avocados, whatever the <laughs> whatever the ranking system is. Four avocados. For your, <laughs> your podcast, your choice. We'd love to get a review from you. Now, the way to support us would be to send us an email. Contact us. Go with the heat at gmail.com. And you know what? If you want to bring a little extra value to the show, I encourage you to go read that support page on our website at GoWithTheHeat.com and find out what some of our future thoughts are about what we want to do with this show. Surprise! Miami Vice only has five seasons. I, in case <laughs> you didn't know it, Miami Vice only has five seasons. And at the pace <laughs> we're going, this time next year, we will be finishing Miami Vice. I know a year seems like it's really far away, but you know what? It's time for us to start talking about 
What's next? Your pals here at Go With The Heat are not done podcasting when Miami Vice is over. We have to decide what show we want to do. And you know what? We have a whole bunch of other shows we would love to do. Some of that's going to take some feedback from our fans. So we would love to hear from you. Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. And go check out that support page. That's something that we just added. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals. But then Melissa started laughing and she almost fell out of her chair. Because <laughs> I was drinking. I had a drink of water in my mouth when you started making that joke. So I started to laugh. So I'm like leaning over in this like folding chair that we have to put my cup down. And I started to fall. Don't make like to catch me. <laughs> I almost killed my dog. <laughs> oh, wait till we're all three in the same room. We're not going to get oh, anything yeah, done. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> <laughs>